Lewis Slotin removed the shims. They were there as a safety measure to stop the plutonium core codenamed Rupert from going critical. Slotin was known to be a bit of a daredevil. Instead of using the shims, he would use just the tip of a screwdriver to stop the neutron reflectors completely encasing the core. Slotin's boss, Enrico Fermi, was displeased with Slotin's apparent recklessness. Fermi told Slotin he'd be dead within a year if he continued to flout the safety protocols. Sadly, Fermi would be right. Rupert would claim its second life just two months after his warning. It would also take on a new name befitting its reputation. This is a tragic true story of the Demon Core accidents. The Demon Core, originally codenamed Rupert, was a 6.2 kilogram plutonium gallium sphere. It was manufactured by the Manhattan Project during World War II. Rupert was planned to be another Fat Man style bomb and the third nuclear bomb dropped on Japan. On August 13th, the manufacture of the core was complete and it was scheduled to be dropped on August the 19th. Luckily though, Japan surrendered on August the 15th, preempting the third nuclear strike. As the war ended, the core remained at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, where a series of extremely dangerous criticality experiments would take place. Criticality is a state in which a nuclear chain reaction is self-sustaining. A nuclear material achieves criticality and is said to be critical when each fission releases a sufficient number of neutrons to sustain an ongoing series of nuclear reactions. This can be achieved in a number of ways, but for this video, you only need to know about one, neutron reflectors. It was discovered that by placing certain neutron reflecting materials around a subcritical mass like the demon core, it could be brought into a state of criticality. This worked by reflecting neutrons emitted by the core back on itself like a mirror. With enough of this reflecting material around a radioactive material, a self-sustaining chain reaction could be produced. The Demon Core was designed to be in a state of just below criticality, which means by itself, a fission chain reaction could not occur. However, if a neutron reflecting material is placed around the sphere, a fission chain reaction could occur. These were the experiments Harry Daglian, and then later his friend, Lewis Slotin, would perform on the plutonium core. The criticality tests were used to guarantee whether the core was manufactured close to the point of criticality, as was intended. The enormous danger of performing these experiments manually was understood by the physicists. However, the remote controlled mechanisms at the time were unreliable. They feared a malfunction could cause a small but still serious nuclear explosion, so they elected to carry on doing the experiments manually. Legendary physicist Richard Feynman reportedly said the experiment was like tickling the tail of a sleeping dragon. This is because the physicists would stack neutron reflecting material around the core, getting it as close to going critical as possible. Unfortunately, this dragon would wake up. On August 21st, 1945, just two days after Rupert was scheduled to be dropped on a Japanese city, it would claim its first life. Harry Daglian was manually building a neutron reflector around the plutonium core, placing 4.4 kilogram tungsten carbide bricks incrementally. Previously that day, two experiments had been conducted, which were very similar but slightly modified. The fatal experiment was scheduled for the next morning, However, instead of waiting, Daglian had decided to start the experiment at 9.55pm. The only other person in the room was a military guard. The guard was seated 10 to 12 feet away, reading a newspaper. Daglian quickly built up a cabin of tungsten carbide bricks around the sphere, each brick bringing the assembly closer to the point of criticality. He picked up the final brick to bring the total to around 236 kilograms and began moving towards the assembly. He noticed from the nearby neutron counters that the addition of this brick would cause the core to become critical. He began withdrawing his hand 
when the brick slipped from his grasp, falling directly onto the plutonium core. This instantly provided enough reflection to make the assembly critical, creating a sustained fission reaction and a large power surge. The room immediately lit up with blue light, illuminating the security guard's newspaper 12 feet away. In a panic, Daglian picked up the block lying across the supercritical plutonium and then dropped it again. In a frenzied attempt to shut the reaction down, he tore at the bricks, but the neutron counter still screamed. He then tried to flip the table containing the assembly, but it was far too heavy. Finally, he methodically deconstructed the assembly, allowing the excess neutrons to escape, stopping the reaction. Initially, Daglian thought himself to be uninjured by the exposure. During the recent Trinity test, he and Slotin had witnessed a physicist get exposed to a supercritical reaction for only a few seconds, and he was still walking around. Sadly, Daglian wasn't so lucky. Not long after the accident, Daglian became nauseous, a common symptom of severe radiation poisoning. He checked himself into hospital, complaining of a tingling sensation in his hands. His family was flown out along with his good friend, Louis Slotin, who would eventually take over Daglian's role. Daglian allowed himself to be studied as the sickness progressed. His hand became blistered and he suffered intense stomach cramps and diarrhoea. By the time he tragically passed away on September 15th, most of the skin on his abdomen and chest had sloughed off. His heroic actions at the laboratory would earn Daglian the undesirable title of being the first American to die from acute radiation poisoning. Daglian was just 24 years old. The security guard, Private Robert J. Hemerley, also received a dose of ionizing radiation. His distance from the assembly would save his life, at least for the time being. He was 29 at the time of the experiment and would live another 33 years. He died from suspected radiation-induced leukemia at age 62. It's May 1946. The plutonium core codenamed Rupert has been scheduled for use in Operation Crossroads, a nuclear bomb test over the Bikini Atoll. Lewis Slotin has received orders to fly out to the Bikini Atoll to review his latest handiwork. It's May 21st, and he's decided to do one last test, both to demonstrate the experiment to his successor, Alvin Graves, and to verify the core's ability to go critical. Including the two men, there are eight people present in the room. This experiment was very similar to the one that had taken Harry Daglian's life. However, instead of using tungsten carbide bricks, it called for using two beryllium half-spheres, to reflect the core's neutrons back on itself. The closer the half-spheres came to closing around the core, the closer the assembly would be to going critical. The standard procedure was to place a number of shims around the core so the beryllium half-spheres could never fully close. Slotin, however, used his own unapproved protocol with no safety shims. Slotin would place one side of the top half directly on the bottom half, with the other side being propped open by the tip of a flathead screwdriver. The top sphere was also held into place via a thumb hole with his left hand. The gap was maintained and changed by twisting the screwdriver. Using this method, Slotin could get the assembly dangerously close to criticality. Slotin, who was apparently given to bravado, had performed this test on numerous occasions and had become the local expert. On one of these occasions, his boss, Enrico Fermi, reportedly told Slotin and others that they would be dead within a year if they continued performing the test in that manner. On the day of the accident, Slotin was performing the experiment as usual, but this time, his screwdriver slipped. The beryllium sphere fell into place around the core. It instantly went critical, emanating a strong blue light and a wave of heat, which almost everyone in the room witnessed. Slotin immediately experienced a sour taste in his mouth and an intense burning sensation in his left hand. He reacted quickly to separate the hot spheres and jerked his left hand up, lifting the brilliant hemisphere and dropping it to the floor, ending the reaction. 
In that fraction of a second, he had absorbed well over the lethal dose of radiation. His position over the assembly shielded most of the other people from a large proportion of the radiation, absorbing most of it himself. His first words after the accident were, well that does it. The lab was evacuated and an ambulance was called. Outside, Stoughton made a sketch of where everyone was standing when the accident happened. It would later be used to determine the rough radiation exposure of the various people present. Slotin vomited numerous times, but by the next day, his health seemed acceptable. His left hand, the one that had been closest to the core, was becoming increasingly painful. As the days went by, his hand took on a waxy blue appearance and then began blistering. His abdomen turned red and virtually all his white blood cells disappeared. Throughout this ordeal, Slotin tried to remain conscious, telling the physicians what he was going through for posterity. By the fifth day, he went downhill quickly. He had severe internal burns. One doctor described them as three-dimensional sunburn. By the seventh day, he had severe mental confusion and his lips turned blue. He was placed in an oxygen tent where he mercifully slipped into a coma. He would die two days later. Louis Slotin was only 35 years old. The closest person to Slotin Alvin Graves, had been peering over his shoulder at the time of the incident. He received a high but not lethal dose of radiation. Graves was hospitalised along with two other men for several weeks. He survived but lived with neurological and vision issues caused by the radiation. He died at age 55 from a heart attack. It's unclear whether this was caused by radiation damage. His father had also died from a heart attack. The other men who were hospitalised fully recovered. They both lived into their 80s. The other people present in the room also received small doses of radiation but went on to live full lives and died of what appeared to be natural causes. After the accidents, nine months to the day apart, the Corps, originally codenamed Rupert, was dubbed the Demon Corps. The manual criticality experiments, nicknamed Tickling the Dragon's Tail, were ended after Slotin's death. Instead, they used remote ones, where the physicists could remain a safe distance. The Demon Corps' use in Operation Crossroads was suspended as it needed time for its radioactivity to decline. Eventually, the plutonium core that had killed two people in America would be melted down and recycled into numerous other nuclear weapons, 